Hi everyone, uh, welcome you all to the second talk in uh, QTech projects. And first of all, I would like to thank the Q Turkey team for organizing this, these events. In particular, this wouldn't have been possible without the support of uh, Furkan, Yasir and Ecem. And uh, I would want to thank our audience for joining us, us today. My name is Onur Pusuluk. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral, postdoctoral research fellow working at the interface of quantum information, quantum thermodynamics and quantum biology at the Koç University in Turkey. And I will moderate today's today's session uh, with my friend Ejem Nur Duman. And uh, the aim of these events uh, is allowed to the grad students from all over the world to share their research projects on quantum technologies. In this way, we hope to get to know each other better uh, and establish a stronger uh, community. Ejem, would you like to say to say uh, something before we kick start the talk? Yes, uh, thank you so much, Ojan, for the kind introduction also. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in and joining us today. We are really excited for our uh, today because it's been a very long time since we have the first event of our new series. Uh, well, uh, I'm an, uh, my name is Ojan Mugumun. I'm an undergraduate physics student at the Yedikape University. Uh, and I also want to give you a quick information related to our uh, series. Well, as you maybe you've seen it on our social media platforms, but we made a call for Q projects. And surprisingly, Shubham was one of them, one of the people who applied for it. And right now, today, here we are, and he's going to uh, present his valuable work uh, uh, on uh, quantum mem uh, memory stores. Well, I'm pretty excited for, day, uh, for that. Anyway, uh, so if uh, I also would like to inform you that uh, call is still valid. So if you're a grad student working in the field of quantum technology, and also if you like to present your work in our quantum uh, QTech project series, uh, we will be happy to have you here. So all you have to do is just uh, filling out the form that I just sent you on the uh, comment box. Uh, just uh, if you just fill out the form, we will get in touch with you in a couple of weeks to talk the details of it. And uh, maybe we can see you in our next Q project. Uh, that's pretty much it, I guess, from my side. And if you have any questions related to our project uh, and our event or about us, uh, please feel free to get in touch with us. Uh, our email address is info at uh, qturkey.com. So uh, that's pretty much it. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Hojam, I think the stage is yours. I can leave it to you. <laughs> hey, thanks a lot, Hojam. And now I would like to invite our guest, Shubham Kumar. Uh, from Shanghai University uh, in China uh, on stage, stage. He would like to shift our focus on quantum memory stores and their applications, uh, possible applications, uh, applications in neuromorphic uh, quantum co computing. Shubham, stage is yours. Uh, please, uh, you can start whenever you are it. Okay, thank you. So thanks for having me here. And kudos to the QTurkey team for having me here and it providing such a great opportunity to interact with researchers around the globe. So I will first start by introducing myself and the group. My name is Shubham Kumar and I'm from India, currently a PhD student at Shanghai University at the Curtis Center. So today I'll be talking about entanglement in quantum ministers and specifically the bipartite entanglement, which is a recent paper that we published in Physical Review A. So this is the group starting from Professor Enrique Solano, who is the group leader, and also the director of the Cortez Center. Here are the postdocs that I have worked with in the last few years. Gabriel Francisco and Francisco Cardenas are the postdocs. And Narendra is a nice friend and a PhD student along with me. So the outline of the talk is as follows. I'll start by introducing what is neuromorphic computing. Then I will introduce the emergence of quantum and neuromorphic computing. What it is, why do we need it, and how are we gonna approach this field? Then we are going to introduce the memristors, both classical and quantum, following which I will introduce the concept of a memristive element in a Josephson junction, which is a natural property of a junction. And this will be the basis for the device that I will introduce in this talk. 
So the device is known as a superconducting quantum emitter, and the main work is focused on the entanglement of these superconducting quantum emitters. Following this, I will explain the non-trivial characteristics of the system that we have obtained. And finally, I will conclude by the approach on how we are going to move towards the neuromorphic quantum computing using these devices. So the first slide is about what is neuromorphic. So it is uh, basically inspired from the neuronal architecture of the brain, the human brain. And technically, the definition goes like this. It refers to the implementation of brain-inspired devices at the software and hardware level for digital and analog computation. So the goal, as the name suggests, is not to perfectly mimic the operation of the brain, but actually to realize biological computation in a practical computing system that we have currently in the globe. So the example of such devices include the neuron and the neural networks, which are well known. The, in the last decade, these two fields, the neuromorphic computing and quantum computing have emerged as, one, uh, as the two most powerful paradigms for computation. And in this decade, actually, there is a quest to realize uh, neuromorphic architectures in the quantum regime. So here is a roadmap on how we started and how we are moving towards. So first point is the identification of memory properties of quantum devices that can be suitable to mimic neuromorphic architectures. Secondly, we can also explore the engineering of memory behavior in quantum systems to mimic such architectures. The third point is if uh, there are memory properties or they can be engineered, how can we relate them to quantum properties such as entanglement? Fourth point is if uh, we intend to find all these answers, how can we use these quantum features for neuromorphic computation? And lastly, how can we scale up such systems? Uh, current state is that we are on the first three points where we have identified some memory properties of the quantum devices that are suitable for these neuromorphic architectures. We have uh, some proposals that have engineered memory behavior in quantum systems to mimic neuromorphic architectures. And the third point is my research, where for the first time we have explored how can we relate quantum properties such as entanglement with the uh, uh, properties, memory properties of the neuromorphic devices. So starting with the emergence of neuromorphic and quantum computing, the technical definition says that it is the implementation of brain-inspired neuronal architectures on quantum hardware and software level for the design of integrated quantum devices. So the first question is, why do we need it? And the answer is rather simple. And there are uh, five points where the first point is we need a speed up in computation in order to apply in, into AI and machine learning applications. Furthermore, furthermore, we would like to gain insight into neural systems using quantum mechanics. Then we can also apply it for memory storage applications, which can be used for the design of dense and powerful architectures, such as a quantum neural network. Second question, how are we gonna approach this problem? Well, there exists two basic approaches, which are digital and analog where the digital comprises of the gate-based quantum circuits for mimicking neural, neural algorithms, for example, a quantum neuron. And this requires the training of variational circuits, and we can apply it for simulating memory strip systems. The analog way, on the other hand, utilizes the dynamics of physical systems, such as a quantum oscillator. And these uh, architectures are, are based on adiabatic dynamics of physical systems. Now, one application of new analog neuromorphic uh, quantum computing is reservoir quantum computing, which was recently introduced. And it uses the reservoir dynamics for computational processes. So introducing the classical MEMBISTER. Uh, here is an image which I have taken from the experimental demonstration of the first MEMBISTER element using a doped semiconductor which was published in Nature 2008 from HP Labs, which represents a doped semiconductor with doped region given by a width of W. And if we apply an 
external voltage, we can actually shift this doped region and alter the width of the doped and undoped region to switch it into another resistive state. So from this, we have the definition of a nonvistor, which is a resistor with memory characterized by pinched hysteretic signatures, which has bistable resistance states. And these resistance states can be achieved by applying a voltage bias, as I just explained in this device. So it has been widely used in classical neuromorphic architectures. And mathematically, they are described by the nonlinear Ohm's law, which is given by the current voltage relationship in this form, where the current is proportional to the non-resistance of the system. And non-resistance is a quantity which depends on the internal variable, x, the voltage, and the time, which describes the nonlinear IV characteristics of the system. Another important equation is the dynamics of the internal variable, which is given by this equation and is related to the membristance. And this dynamics actually describes the uh, microscopic reconfiguration, which is used to achieve different stable states. The IV characteristics of the system looks somewhat like this, which is a nonlinear uh, curve. The only interesting thing here is that it is a pinched hysteresis loop which characterizes the memory properties of the system. So the mechanism of this membrane is traced to the microscopic atomic rearrangement in an electronic component, as I just explained in the previous slide. And such rearrangements can happen in presence of external bias, and this corresponds to a stable atomic or molecular configuration to achieve a stable state. Now, a little bit of history for the quantum uh, regime where we have identified and engineered some non-restrictive properties. The first realization of uh, non-restrictive element in the quantum domain was uh, done in 2014 in this paper by Piotta and Massimiliano de Ventra, which was published in PR Applied, where they explored the natural non-restrictive property of the Josephson junction. Mm -hmm. Following this, uh, this was actually a semi-classical approach and a complete quantum approach was produced later in 2017. And there were actually two works in superconducting circuits for realizing membership elements. One was based on the continuous measurement protocol and feedback mechanism. And the other was just the quantum version of the first device, the superconducting memberships. All both these works were realized by Professor Enrique Solano's group in Spain, who is also my PhD supervisor. And following this, recently we have explored the bipartite entanglement of these superconducting quantum membranes, which was published in BRA. And after that, we have analyzed the tripartite entanglement, which is currently under review. So in this talk, our focus is on the bipartite entanglement of quantum membranes. Important to mention that. In parallel, there was also a proposal for a quantum membrane in quantum photonics, which was again from Professor Enrique Solano's group. And good news is that this device was uh, not exactly this device, but a little different, was recently realized and published in Nature Photonics, which is known as an experimental photonic quantum membrane by the group of Philip Walter in Vienna. So this is in the news these days. Now I will introduce the quantum membrane, which is the subject of this talk. Membranes in the quantum regime have been proposed as dissipative nonlinear elements and with beam splitters with feedback mechanisms. Now there are uh, basically three types of proposals, but here I have included only two, which are more relevant for this talk. The first one is the quantum membrane based on superconducting circuits, which utilizes the connected Josephson junctions in a loop which is known as a superconducting quantum interference device and in short squid and this is uh, input with an external flux using an outer loop such that an internal current setups in the circuits and using some conditions we obtain a membrane behavior this mechanism i will be explaining from the next slides the second one is the membrane based on quantum photonics, which utilizes a beam splitter mechanism and a feedback, classical feedback mechanism. So here in, in the blue area, 
we represent this as a beam splitter. A and B are the nodes, the input nodes where photons can enter, and D and C are the output nodes where one of the nodes is used for classical feedback while the other is used for when detecting photons. So this was taken from the experimental quantum understood, which was just realized. Now I will go to explain the member strip element in our Joseph Sign junction. And this is the basis for the device that I'll be explaining in this talk. So Josephson junctions have an intrinsic memory resistive character. And this is actually stems from the virtual transfer of Cooper pairs via cross particle tunnel. Actually in Josephson junctions, uh, BD Josephson has predicted the total current to be of this form, where the first term is, as you all know, it is a famous non-dissipative critical current, which is used for designing qubits. The second one is the phase dependent quasi-particle current. And the last one is the explicit quasi-particle current. And in our words, we have considered the part of the third part to be negligible because of the regime we are working in. And so we focus on the first two currents. Interestingly, it was shown by Piotr and Deventra in 2014, the peer applied paper that the second term has a manifestive character and it can be proved from BCS theory that it can take this form, which is of a, which is a form of a manifestive element where the epsilon GL is the resistance and the plus phi is the voltage, which is related to the external, sorry, the current. So this current is represented by this figure which I have shown here. So what you see here is a junction with a, a, a Josephson junction with wafers of different band gaps, delta one and delta two, and represents a transfer of Cooper pair from one side of the junction to another side. So what happens is that when sufficient energy is provided, these Cooper pairs can break up into opposite vector single electrons, quasi particles, as you can see here, the K1, the K vector breaks up and changes to the N vector and it transfers or tunnels into the other side of the junction. And then it combines with another free quasi particle to form another Cooper pair. So this is kind of a virtual transfer of the Cooper pair from one side to other side via quasi particle tunneling. So in this talk, the device that I have studied is based on this mechanism. And in order to realize a membristor using this phenomena, what we need is that the membristive current, the phase dependent quasi particle current, should dominate the critical current. And for this purpose, we have a setup which is, looks like this and is known as a superconducting quantum interference device. So the goal using this setup is that we need that the membership features uh, depend on the dominance of the cosine current over the Josephson current. So the goal is to produce a dominant membership behavior. And for in this setup, what we can have is that by applying an external flux, we can set up currents in the loop such that they can interfere either constructively or destructively, depending on, on the phase of the junctions. And we can achieve a state where we can cancel out one of the currents producing a dominant behavior of the other current. So we need to have a dominant membership character. And for this, we need to have a destructive interference of the critical current. And to completely cancel them out, we need to have them equal. And this imposes a constraint or a condition which was given by Ambukauter and Baratov relation, which is given by this equation, which basically means that we, when the critical currents are equal, we need to have different gap band gaps of the junctions. So for this reason, we have denoted these junctions with different colors, denoting different band gaps. And the second condition is that the external magnetic flux should be fixed to half a flux quantum. And this means that the difference in phase of the Josephson junctions will be equal to pi. 
And when we apply this condition, we can have equal and opposite critical currents so that they cancel out. And this will amplify the number strip current so that we have a dominant number strip contribution in the circuit. So following this architecture, uh, this was actually uh, this, this was actually a semi-classical approach. And following this uh, completely quantum approach was produced by Professor Enrique Solano Cook. And this involves a simple mechanism, a simple difference that the squid loop is connected to an external inductor. And that external loop is fed with an external time-dependent flux. So in this circuit, the equivalent uh, current Currents can be shown in this via this circuit. As you can see, the charging current, the quasi particle current, and the inductive current. So, the quasi particle current is, uh, is the member strip part, which is in this loop, which can be controlled by the external flux applied on this outer loop. So, this system actually represents an LC resonator, which is coupled to a quasi particle bus that induces the system's dissipation with a time dependent deviation. So, the reason for applying an external inductor was that since we do not have any nonlinear inductive element in this loop, we need an inductive contribution for the canonical quantization to follow. So for this reason, we have an external inductor. And the description of the system and bath is as follows. The total Hamiltonian describing the system is composed of two elements, which are these, and these are respectively described as the system Hamiltonian and the quasi-particle tunneling Hamiltonian. So the system Hamiltonian is a rather simple, which takes a form of a harmonic oscillator where EC and EL are the charging and inductive energies and N and phi are the charge and phase operators. Phi D is the external time dependent flux. The interesting part is the quasi-particle tunneling Hamiltonian because it is the source for the member strip behavior. So this is given by this form where t is a tunneling rate and this depends on some constants u m u n which are known as Bogolibo amplitudes and are for this work we have assumed it to be constant and phi is the external phase the hermitian conjugate in this expression corresponds to the tunneling in the opposite side so the effect of the environment in the system that corresponds to the tunneling of quasi particles between the CS squid with the electrode forming the reservoir. And this leads to energy relaxation on the quantum resistor. And by perturbation theory, using Fermi's golden rule, we can find a decay rate in the system uh, where we have assumed the tunneling Hamiltonian as a perturbation. And we can derive it, the decay rate to be of this form, which is a matrix element. And depends on the initial and final energy states as given here, and also is proportional to the quasi particle spectral density. And these expressions have been studied from these two references. If one is interested, one can take a look into this. The system dynamics of this device is governed by the Lindblad form of evolution, which describes the decay induced by the quasi particles on each oscillator. So we have an LC oscillator as an effective system which is coupled to quasi particles. We use an adiabatic driving to compress the system for a two level approximation for a two level driving. And this is because we want to avoid the generation of extra quasi particles in the system, which can inhibit the member strip behavior. So after performing the two-level approximation and adiabatic estimation, we can have certain constraints and the dynamics of the system can be described by this form of Lindblad evolution, which in which the first term is the expect uh, the commutator between the Hamiltonian, Hamiltonian and the density operator, and the last two terms describe the decay in the system. And these uh, these decays are related to the collapse operators, which in turn are related to the decay rate of the system. And these decay rates corresponds to the transition between final and initial states, corresponding to the first two levels only. 
So we can actually derive the time dependent decay rate to be of this form for this two level approximation. And we, here we have considered the quasi particle spectral density to be equivalent to the frequency of the oscillators. And interestingly, due to the flux wide quantization on the outer loop, we can find that the decay rate also takes the form given by this equation, where we can see it depends on the cosine of the external flux. The hysteresis signature, which is the fingerprint of a member strip device, uh, can be seen in this setup. And it has a decaying character. And here I have so shown it for 10 oscillations. And as you can see, both the hysteresis loops and the current voltage dynamics with respect to time decay uh, with each oscillation. So following this, we have proposed the coupling of these two superconducting devices. And this is rather simple to, to obtain, and we achieve it via either a capacitor or an inductor as shown in this figure. So these two parts represent the same circuit that I presented in the last slide. The only difference is that they are coupled via either an inductor or a capacitor. So the total Hamiltonian governing, governing this system is given by this form of Hamiltonian, which represents the two oscillators and the coupling. And it can either be capacitive or inductive, depending on the coupling. And an immediate composition of this Hamiltonian can yield us this form of Hamiltonian quantum Hamiltonian complete, which where the frequencies are omega one and omega two corresponding to the oscillators and alpha beta are the coupling amplitudes. Uh, the open quantum system dynamics of the system has a certain difference, which is simple from the previous case. Uh, just that we add one more term for the decay corresponding to the second oscillator. So this actually represents a system of coupled quantum harmonic oscillators interacting with their respective local reservoirs. Now, the member strip characteristics of these coupled quantum member strips are rather in, more interesting than the single ones. In what follows, we obtain that the hysteresis curves show a shrinking and expansion behavior, as you can see in this figure, where I have plotted the hysteresis loops for uh, seven oscillations and for the oscillations starting from 0 to 2.5, which have been colored with blue, we can see that they decay for, they de start decaying initially and suddenly after 2.5 oscillations, they start to revive as the red curves you can see. And then they start to decay again. And this phenomena continues as the oscillations increase and this is what is called as the shrinking and expansion of the hysteresis curves, which is the first time we have obtained and in the quantum regime. And also there were no works in the classical member strip elements where the, someone has obtained such kind of non-trivial characteristic. So in order to quantify the member strip feature of this device, we have introduced a quantity which is known as a form factor, which is nothing but the area divided by perimeter square of the hysteresis loop and multiplied by four pi so that we make it a dimensionless quantity and is suitable to quantify the performance of a decaying quantum system. And this plot shows the form factor for the uncoupled quantum investors and the coupled ones, keeping in mind that the investors are taken to be identical. So we can plot the form factor for any one of them. So the straight curves corresponds to the single quantum emitter, which is uncoupled. So this behavior is can be understood as the fact that the area and perimeter square for the single emitter hysteresis curves decay with the same rate, so that the form factor is a constant. While for the coupled system, we see a decay and a rise in the form factor as the oscillations uh, go on. And remarkably, we see that the form factor actually caused an uncoupled case for some oscillations. And this is a nice result. So following this, we tried to investigate the entanglement dynamics of the system. 
And to quantify the entanglement, we use the measure of concurrence. And the plot looks like somewhat this. And where we can see the rise and decay in the concurrence too. And this entanglement starts from an initially zero because we have chosen an initially unentangled state. It goes to a maximal value. Then it undergoes a phenomena which is known as an entanglement sudden death, which is followed by an entanglement sudden birth. And the and in the in, inset, you can see that there is a finite time for the entanglement sudden death, after which the entanglement rises again. And this oscillation continues uh, as the time goes on. So a natural question which arises by saying this form of dynamics is that where does the entanglement disappear? And also, is there a relation between entanglement in the coupled quantum emissors with the membristivity of the reservoir? Because both intend to show a rise and decaying behavior. So for this purpose, we try to investigate the interplay between entanglement and membristivity. And for this, we just plotted the concurrence along with the form factor. And what we see is somewhat the, more, the most interesting result and the core result of our work, which shows an inverse relation between the form factor and the entanglement dynamics. So as you can see, the maximal and minimal of entanglement coincides with the minimal and maximal of the form factor respectively. And the final result was that the entanglement and the list of dynamics follow an inverse behavior. And this phenomena is related to the information that flow between the system and the reservoir. And we find that the loss of information due to a decay of quantum correlations shows up in the reservoir that increases the membership property and vice versa. So following this non-trivial feature, we also investigated some important features. Uh, the first one is a dynamic response where we try to uh, explore how can one quantum investor influence the dynamics of the other. And this is important in the sense that in neuromorphic architectures, we need to alter the dynamics of one unit using the state on the another unit. So to investigate this dynamics, we choose the input through the qubit state, which can be varied with the help of the real angle and the complex angle. And what I show here are two plots for quantum investor one and two, which are represented by the blue and orange color respectively. So quantum investor one is initialized in the same state for the figures A and B both, which is choosing real angle and complex angle to be pi by four and pi by two respectively. And we change the state of the second quantum investor. Uh, as you can see in figure A, it has a certain state and figure B, it has another state. And in figure B, figure B, it goes into a zero complex angle because of which the member strip character is very negligible. But as you can see, changing the state of one of the quantum emitter also influences the dynamics of the other. And this is rather a cool result because this allows us to alter the dynamics of one quantum emitter using the state of the other. Another important feature that we investigate is the relation of the hysteresis direction with the entanglement. And we what we found is somewhat interesting again. And the result is as follows. We first initialize the quantum ambassador one and two with an initial state such that the hysteresis direction of, the, of both of them are opposite initially, which can be seen from the arrows here, which point in the opposite direction. And also from the IV curves with respect to time, which are out of phase. So, as we see with time, as the oscillations happen, they, these curves have their directions shifted into the opposite direction. And this happens at time period t equal to three. And when we investigated this time scale with that of the entanglement, we found that it happens whenever the entanglement reaches its maximum value. And this feature 
uh, can be seen readily as the oscillations increase. So following this, I would like to explain how we are moving towards neuromorphic computing using membistors. And I would like to take the example of the classical membistor, which were used for neural networks. And in analog classical neural networks, uh, membistors have been used in crossbar architectures for pro the proposal of neural networks, and also they have been experimentally realized. So a crossbar architecture looks somewhat like this, which is a cross connection of a lot of wires, and each wire is connected to the other using a membistor at the cross point. So this connection actually allows to input a voltage at one part of the circuit and control the dynamics of the membistors at some other part of the circuit because they are connect interconnected using these cross wires. This picture was taken from a nice paper, which is which I have referenced here. And one can take a look if he is interested, he or she is interested. Now, the natural question is whether we can use quantum investors for neural networks for applications in neuromorphic quantum computing. So recently, there is a field known as reservoir computing that has been coming up and which is basically a paradigm which provides data processing via nonlinear high dimensional system, which is the reservoir. So we basically use the dynamics of the reservoir for computational purposes. And the benefit of having such a paradigm is that in contrast to general neural networks, only the readout network needs to be trained. And one example I want to show is the recent realization of the experimental photonic quantum resistors where they were used in the reservoir network for reservoir computing, where as you can see the M1, M2, and M3 are the membistors, the optical quantum membistors. These cross wires are the representation of a beam splitter. And what we have is that we input a quantum state, which goes into an information scrambling process inside the reservoir. And it comes out into the read output where they are trained. So in this work, the quantum investors provide non-linearity and a short-term memory. And it was shown that this architecture actually performs better than its classical counterpart. So there's a question if whether the entangled quantum membristors in the superconducting domains can be useful in reservoir quantum computing for creating the interconnected networks of quantum investors inside this reservoir. So this is something which we are exploring now and seems like a plausible exploration or near term. And also we want to see if the interconnected, interconnected membership devices can provide a better control of the architecture and can help in improving the performance even better than what was observed in this paper. So following this, there are certain major challenges while realizing such neuromorphic architectures basically concerning the membistive behavior of the device that I have introduced in this talk. The first one is having a dominant membristive behavior, which actually depends on the cancellation of critical currents. And this is experimentally a difficult task to obtain. Secondly, we want that the membristive current is free from noise and does not lose its membristive character the device does not lose its membership character. The third thing is that we want a protocol where measurement of membership current can be applied in superconducting circuits. And uh, this was explored in 2011 in a paper which was published in Physical Review B and is entitled Phase-Dependent phase Quasiparticle Tunneling in Josephson Junctions, where they measured the cross phi term with the superconducting charge for it. And for applications to neuromorphic computing, there needs to be some more works, uh, experimental works regarding the measurement of membership current in superconducting circuits. The fourth one is the famous engineering problem in quantum computing, which is the scalability. So these are basically experimental challenges that we will face for 
realizing the neuromorphic quantum computing using memristors. So with this, I would like to conclude this talk with the following conclusions. Now, the first one, we showed how non-trivial properties in the entangled quantum memristors have emerged. The second one is how the coupling correlates to input and that produces a shrink and expansion of the hysteresis loop as a consequence of which the periodic decays and revivals of the membership curves have emerged, which are also the associated memories of the quantum membership. The third thing is that this behavior is inversely related to the quantum correlations generated in the composite system. And the fourth one is that the direction of the hysteresis curve is periodically reversed during the time evolution. And interestingly, we find that this change in direction happens whenever the entanglement reaches a maximum value. Furthermore, this system, the composite system shows entanglements are in death and birth. And lastly, there is a possibility that such features can be utilized for NeuroQC using uh, NISC architectures. And with this, I would like to conclude. So that's all. And if there are any questions from the audience, I would like to welcome it. So up to you guys. And thanks a lot, uh, Shubham. It was a great talk. I couldn't see any questions uh, written uh, either in the YouTube chat or uh, Zoom chat. But if our audience ha uh, have any question, uh, they can unmute themselves and ask their questions. Uh, Hujam, uh, 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 other than that, actually, I can start with a question. Okay. It's okay. <laughs> well, my first question is actually, you mentioned some uh, obstacles that you faced while uh, working on the quantum memristor, and one of them was the separating noise from the memristor terms, right? And I have a question. Maybe, you know, we see lots of articles and news about uh, the, you know, uh, using quantum uh, programming in order to, you know, eliminate the noise in quantum computers. So maybe, uh, like, my question is, can we use quantum programming or error correction, maybe? Uh, can we solve this problem, at least, and make it better? Well, I think that this device is rather tricky in the sense that we are actually trying to measure a part of the noise, which is the phase-dependent part of the quasi-particle current. It is a quasi-particle current which has an interesting property that it is memristic. And that quasi-particle current can become dominant via certain conditions. So using error correction, I'm not sure if uh, we can approach this problem because I think error corrections have been particularly used for qubit architectures, which have purely uh, focused on the non-dissipative part of the current in superconducting circuits, not on the dissipative one. So, well, this is an experimental problem and maybe some future works can answer this. But you can, yeah, you can check out, check out that paper that I mentioned in PRB, where they measure the cost five current. But from the point of view of pro programming, I don't think it would be feasible because it is purely an experimental problem. In theory, we can usually do it. We can say that we have these, these conditions and we can obtain a behavior. Okay, I see. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Is there any questions from audience? If not, I, I have also a lot of uh, questions from the theoretical uh, side. But Ajahn, if you have any other technological uh, question, you can ask them uh, before I start my theoretical questions. But I think I can ask after you. I, I, it's okay. okay. I have a few questions. For okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Shubham, is it possible for you to go to the slide in which uh, you decompose the system Hamiltonian uh, in turn harmonic oscillator and cause a particle uh, tunneling? Yeah, sure. Uh, if I understand correctly, the memristic current is the cause of cause of particle current. Yeah. And when I and when I look at uh, your Hamiltonian, the 
tunneling uh, uh, constant uh, the tunneling rate is constant here this the uh, hopping constant t is a constant so the close uh, you, you cannot see any uh, memory still behavior uh, in the closed system dynamics this is one of your uh, assumptions and then uh, you allow uh, this system to interact uh, with a bet. This bet is not uh, too clear for me. For, uh, first of all, is it possible for you to uh, elaborate on the definition of your uh, bet? Yeah, actually, the bet is the quasi-particle current, the phase-dependent quasi-particle current. And this system is the LC oscillator. And the oh. inductive and capacitive contributions come from the inductor okay. and capacitor used in the circuit. So in this uh, work, we have primarily focused on the decay mechanism of the system because that is where the membership feature lies. Okay, then uh, here the H total is the total Hamiltonian of the system at the bed. Uh, then I think uh, you take your system as a two-level. Uh, yeah, we approximate it as a two-level system. What was the motivation behind this approximation? Yes, because if we have, uh, first thing is that we, we want a simplicity in this system. The second mm -hmm. thing is that we want to avoid the extra generation of quasiparticles, particles, which may happen with excitations if we have more levels. I see. Uh, so here, we using an adiabatic driving. Okay, here uh, we have an environment assisted uh, memory stiff uh, behavior. And when I look at your uh, master equation, I think it was uh, in the uh, following slide. Yeah. It's a Lindblad master equation, uh, which means that uh, you assume Markov unity. But yeah. in general, uh, if there are any memory effects related uh, with the environment, we use uh, non Markovian uh, master yeah. equations. Did you consider to check what happens in the non Markovian regime? No, actually, we haven't explored that yet. Because we are not uh, exactly sure about the memory behavior of this system it does actually correspond to the uh, memory behavior that is observed in in, uh, in uh, general open quantum systems, from which from where we transfer from a Markovian uh, appro approximation to a non-Markovian approximation, considering the memory effects. So we are not sure whether these memory effects correspond exactly to that. Because here the memory quantification is actually rather different. We quantify it by the area by, of the hysteresis loops. Is there any other identificator uh, of this memory cell behavior rather than this uh, hysteresis? Well, there are three. Two are quantitative and one mm -hmm. is qualitative. The quantitative are the ones uh, which describe the memory cell equations which are the input-output relations. Mm -hmm. In this case, it is the current and voltage. And the second one is the dynamics of the internal, internal variable, which can be either charge or flux, depending on the system. Okay. So using the external flux, we control the system. And this flux is actually the internal variable for our purpose. And mm -hmm. the quantitative description is given by the pinched hysteresis curves. So, okay. Whenever you obtain a pinched hysteresis curve along with these two equations, then kudos to you where you have found the member's development. I see. Um, and you did uh, these simulations. Uh, then uh, did you uh, compare your results with experimental data? If not this, yet. not it. Experimental realization is rather tricky, which I explained. The challenges are purely experimental. In theory, we can do anything. It was the same actually with the photonic quantum member mm -hmm. but somehow the Vienna group did a fantastic job by realizing it in the quantum photonics domain. But hope so that we can also do it in the superconducting world. Uh, 
uh, for this part of your work, it would be interesting for me uh, if you could compare the non-Markovian and Markovian uh, yeah. dynamics. And I have also some questions about bipartite uh, entangled uh, memory stars. Yeah. Uh, here, I think you couple two uh, circuits by using this uh, co conductor. Uh, again, you assume that each circuit is a two-level system. Yeah. Uh, then the beds are local. Yeah. And they are separated. They, they are separated beds. Yeah. Uh, one, one other uh, interesting theoretical question is that what happens if uh, beds are not local or uh, if the master equation is uh, global. In this case, one uh, bed can reach to the other circuit as well. Uh, th th this may be an interesting uh, question uh, for me. But here, I think uh, there is uh, something more, more important. Uh, when you assume each circuit is a two-level system, then you can quantify the uh, correlations between them by concurrence or, or uh, other kind of uh, measures uh, well known in quantum information. But if you make them harmonic oscillators, then you have some continuous uh, systems and uh, the behavior of harmonic oscillators uh, sometimes can be quite different than the uh two 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 level systems uh and i think uh, for uh, this system you can extend your description to make the circuits harmonic uh, oscillators and i think there are some available measures uh if your states are gaussian uh this is the uh, other thing and also, after this quantization, the con, uh, capacitor disappears. Am I right? The capacitor disappears? Yes, you, you have two two level systems, and then also you have bets. But yeah, because we are you, uh, assuming weak coupling. So okay, but uh, in real uh, circuit, I think. Uh, you can see some correlations between the uh, capacitor and each circuit. But here, maybe uh, uh, you see an effective correlation. Uh, I don't know. Uh, that should be a real bipartite co uh, correlations, quantum correlations between two circuits. If you uh, keep conductor as an independent uh, system in, in, in this model. Uh, do you think, uh, do you have an idea what happens if you keep a uh, conductor as an individual system in this model? Well, then we'll break the two level approximation first of all, because via adiabatic estimation, even when we couple these systems, we perform another adiabatic approximation and find reasonable parameters using which we can work in, in inside the two-level approximation. So when we take the Hamiltonian of the, sorry, the... No problem. So if we take the contribution of the capacitor into this Hamiltonian, mm -hmm. we will break the two-level approximation and the system will try to be different. So that will be a completely different approach. Uh, also, you said that you have a uh, following up uh, paper in which you caused the tripartite entanglement. Yeah. Uh, in this case, I think uh, you add one more circuit. Or we actually. What, what is the third PSD, system? Uh, include one more LC oscillator. I see. Sorry, the number step element and couple them. And we can have a linear or a triangular array connections of these three quantum ambassadors. 
Yes. I think you can check uh, tripartite correlations even in this system. Uh, in somehow, if you can uh, put uh, capacitor uh, in the third system, because it is always uh, speculative when you say that you couple two system by using another element, but then this element disappears. Uh, in 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 the model. Uh, Actually, uh, we can. Uh, what I said was that we can either use a capacitor or an inductor. Here in the figure, I have shown both of them. Okay. Yeah. So, at one time, we are using either an inductor or a capacitor. So it is purely a classical connection here. What changed yeah. in in the model? Uh, I think it should be related with the. Alpha and beta, how uh, capacitor uh, enters into this uh, model? Or sorry, can you repeat your question? I um, how capacitor enters into these equations? Is this alpha and beta, or uh, which parameters depends on the capacitor or the other elements Actually, that you connect? If we have a capacitor circuits. coupling, then alpha corresponds to the capacitive one. Okay. And if we have an inductive coupling, then beta corresponds to the inductive inductive one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, they are effectively uh, appearing in the uh, interaction uh, constants. Then, yeah. sorry, I have a lot of questions. Um, I think go. I have more. Let me check your slides. Also, you said that there's an inverse relation between the bipartite entanglement and the memory still behavior. Exactly. Um, it, it's uh, too interesting. Uh, uh, can you elaborate on this re relation? Uh, how can we interpret this? Uh, does it mean that uh, quantumness uh, in somehow prevents this uh, memor memory effects? Well, in this case, uh, actually what happens is uh, there was a work in 2008 from my professor uh, and this was uh, on investigating the entanglement between two coupled cavities which are interacting with their local reservoirs. Mm -hmm. So what they found was that in their system two, they had an entanglement, sudden death and sudden birth. But what they found was that when the entanglement of the system decays, the entanglement between the reservoir suddenly and necessarily emerges. So their basic finding was that when entanglement decays, it goes into the reservoir degrees of freedom and uh, increases their entanglement measure. But for in, in this case, we also try to do the same to answer whether the where does the entanglement disappear. But in our, our system is rather different from them in the sense that we do not have a notion of states uh, describing the reservoirs. So what we only had was the form factor, which is also a measure of memory uh, of information of the reservoir degrees of freedom. And for that purpose, we investigated this and found this property, which is actually quite similar to that result. I see. Uh, if I understand correctly, the entanglement between the reservoir and the uh, system actually generates this memory behavior. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. when the uh, circuits become entangled because of the entanglement monogamy, they are decoupled from their uh, reservoirs and this inhibits the memory state behavior. Yeah, for, I mean, uh, from the plots, we can say that, okay. that it happens in this bipartite case. In the tripartite case, what we have obtained is that this behavior rather switches and we obtain a linear relationship so that oh. the maximum of both the quantum correlations and the compactor coincide, coincide with each other. The, so, uh, the so it is actually an interplay of information backflow between the system and the yes. reservoir. So they are becoming ordered. And this ordering is only observed when the memristors are identical. 
let me make it non identical this exact relationship starts to switch i mean they we we, we cannot figure out any exact relationship they become scrambled so that like that quite interesting thank thanks a lot for your answers i think i have to read your papers more carefully after asking more questions and thank you. let let's ask uh, our audience if we have any more questions and let me also check youtube hey john maybe you have more questions <laughs> yes ajay actually i have few ones but uh, i think they are kind of related to the experiments so far but i can ask i mean if if it's okay shubham <laughs> Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, well, uh, my question is kind of maybe it's silly. I don't know. Uh, but uh, you know there are different types of superconducting qubits. So I was wondering whether, like, when you change the type of qubit in superconducting of the charge or you know other type of uh, superconducting qubits, your design of your memory cell does change, or like the connection style does does it change that much? Or I was. Wondering that actually, but yeah, I think this would be an interesting area to explore. Hmm. What happened with a uh, charging device and things like that, because they will introduce some different types of physics. Hmm. But uh, I'm afraid that I can answer this exactly at this point before because I haven't explored it yet. And certainly, our device is not a qubit in the sense that we have cancelled the critical currents. Hmm. and we are focusing on some other part of the josephson total current contribution which have been rather neglected from decades uh, from decades we have only focused on the critical current because they you know, these were the non dissipative parts and the cool guys but and the quasi particles have been treated as a bad guys because they produce noise in the system but the phase dependent quasi particle current is rather an interesting area to explore which we have done Okay, great. Thank you so much. <laughs> maybe yeah. actually there was a also Rajam, maybe you seen before also. Uh, there was a question on the registration form. I think it's good to ask. Uh, so the question was uh, like, what is like? Can we use quantum memory stores in different types of computers? Quantum computers suggest that, uh, for example, ionic trapped ion quantum computers and photonic uh, quantum computers. And if we, if so, if we can do this, then what's the difference, main difference? Like, does uh, do yeah. you, does are there any advantages of using in superconducting circuits? Actually, it is an important question, and uh, since this field is an upcoming field, we are still, as I mentioned in the first slide. Let me go back to the first slide. we are currently on the first three stages so in superconducting circuits this member state behavior arises naturally so this is the first point and in quantum devices this is the only uh, system which shows natural member state behavior because it is the intrinsic current which shows the member state behavior but in quantum regimes we have also there have been works where people have engineered memory strip properties using the photonic quantum memory strip for example so what they do is that using some feedback mechanisms and continuous measurements they engineer hysteresis loops and then they have a complete member strip setup which then they apply for computation so the advantage depends on many factors in superconducting circuits you have macroscopic quantum phenomena which means that you can control the quantum physics using the macroscopic variables while in uh, photonic setups uh, this is rather difficult but in photonic setups uh, for, uh, for example in superconducting uh, setups it is experimentally difficult to obtain the memory strip behavior while in the photonic one it is comparatively easier to obtain the memory strip behavior and so which was realized recently in the nature photonics paper so i would say that it is just i mean there are many factors which uh, using which we can compare which field is better and it is a matter of exploration currently this will be nice 
Thank you so much. Okay, you're welcome. Shubham, let me ask a few more questions uh, regarding the relation between <clears throat> quantum memory stores and neuromorphic uh, computation. Yes. In brain, in, in, in brain synapses are uh, give some non-linearity and they have some memory effects. In this okay. sense, uh, you can make an analogy between memory stores and the synapses, but uh, synapses is not the only uh, element of uh, biologic computation. We have neurons and then uh, actually we don't know uh, where is the actual uh, part of uh, biological computation, but in somehow I think that uh, memory stores can be some elements which connect uh, com uh, computational elements. Am I right? Yeah. Uh, in the classical architecture, this has already been, already been explored. How memory stores can be used for designing, for example, a quantum neuron, a synapse, and a neural network for applications to neuromorphic computing. In the quantum case, we are for such applications to follow. Uh, we have certain works to do before we go to that stage, and which is the first four, first three things that need to be answered here. And we are currently on the verge of exploring those things. But and uh, this is only the first work that I have just explained, which explores the quantum properties in relation to the memoristic properties. And we intend to follow up with some more works to develop a complete understanding and then approach the application part. I see. But uh, in any case, let me ask the question in this way. Uh, yeah. Here, the memory behavior is the quasi particle uh, current. Is there any candidate uh, com competing element? Uh, which can couple to each other by uh, this cause particle current? Actually, uh, the description of memristor is rather specific. A general description is uh, that of a memristive element. And, and memristive elements cons consist not only of uh, nonlinear resistors, but also capacitors and inductors. And those are known as mem inductive and mem capacitive elements. And it is also a fact that the critical currents have kind of a hysteresis behavior, which have been explored previously. So maybe we can also explore whether those elements can behave as a mem inductive because it is a nonlinear inductive part of the Josephson junction. Yes. So uh, there was one more work, I actually forgot to mention it. It was from uh, Raiken in Japan, from the group of Franco Nori, where they proposed the Mem capacitors, mem inductors, and sorry, mem capacitors and mem inductors only in using superconducting circuits. Okay. That was uh, produced as a follow up of the superconducting numbers. So you may try to check that, check those out. And that is also interesting. And uh, for the general audience, let me ask one more question. I think I should ask this at the beginning of questions, but I forgot uh, to ask it. Here, the, the most important uh, part of the system is this quasi particles. What are these quasi particles? Uh, in, I think for general audience, we know that. Uh, in superconductivity, yeah. we have copper pairs, but uh, these copper pairs are formed uh, by electrons. Or can, can you elaborate on the yes. Uh, yes, these these are, quasi particles? Actually, the quasi particles are the single electrons, and the copper pairs are the correlated interaction of these opposite vector electrons. So inside a lattice, these electrons behave as quasi particles because they have their masses and other physical properties changed due to the interactions with other uh, quasi particles around them. So for this reason, they, these are not labeled as electrons, but quasi particles. You mean and they are dressed with, for example, phonons or others? 
uh, kind really of. It depends like, on the system. In this okay. case, it is just the Cooper pairs and the electrons. Okay. Yeah. Let's check YouTube once again. I think uh, we ask all the questions. Ajam, did you forget any question from the registration forms? Uh, Ajam, let me check again. Uh, but I guess we asked all of them. I mean, there were a few questions and we combined them. And yeah, nothing left. Yeah. Shubham, thank you very much for sharing uh, your research with us. It was a great, great talk uh, for us, and uh, we learned a lot. Uh, and thank you for inviting me here, and it was a great experience interacting with you guys. And you guys are very cheerful, so I had a positive environment around me. So thanks for that. <laughs> thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, can anyone uh, reach you if uh, they have uh, further questions? Sure, they can. I, I, yeah, okay. I think we can add uh, your email address on the description when we upload it on YouTube. <laughs> sure, I may. Uh, shall I give my email address or you already? Oh, I, I, we already have. <laughs> yeah, we already have. Okay, then. That's fine. You can do it. <laughs>